It is, I think, a cliche that the world is networked as never before, but like many cliches, it's also true. And you can see in this extraordinary map of Facebook's global network of two point something billion users just how astonishingly networked our world has become. Notice that there are very few places on Earth that don't have Facebook users. There are the oceans, uh, the, the poles of North and South, and China. What's also extraordinarily striking is just how much time we all spend online. Uh, the average adult American is spending around six and a half hours a day uh, on digital media. And you may have noticed the way in which people now are addicted to their smartphones. I'm told it's even worse in China, where people are on their smartphones almost twice as much time as Americans. But what nobody quite expected was what would happen in a networked world. Because back in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, it was generally assumed that if we were all connected, everything would be awesome. John Perry Barlow wrote a wonderful Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace back in the 90s. We're creating a world where anyone anywhere may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. And Mark Zuckerberg, who never took my class at Harvard, <laughs> and there have been terrible consequences arising from that omission on his part. For years, as Facebook was growing exponentially, would argue that he was building a global community. There's a little quotation there from his Harvard commencement speech of a, a few years ago that captures that idea. We were all going to be netizens in a wonderful decentralized world where we would all have our own blogs and speak truth to power and share cat videos. That was the idea. But it didn't work out that way. I thought once everybody could speak freely and exchange information and ideas, the world is automatically going to be a better place. I was wrong about that. Those were the words of Ev Williams, one of the founders of Twitter, in an interview in the New York Times in 2017. Well, if he had taken my course at Harvard, then he would have been less surprised that an interconnected world was not actually totally awesome. So what happened? Well, with amazing speed, the decentralized distributed network that Tim Berners-Lee called the World Wide Web became dominated by a very small number of giant companies of which the most important were network platforms. Amazon, Google, Facebook. And these network platforms have established almost monopolistic power in certain sections of the economy. They've also been spectacularly profitable companies uh, terrific investments, as this chart uh, makes clear, tracking their performance all the way back uh, to 2015. The biggest unintended consequence of a networked world was this. Donald Trump, who joined Twitter in March 2009, last time I looked, has tweeted 39,700 times, follows 46 people, and has 55.6 million followers. If you followed opinion polls in 2016, you thought that Donald Trump would lose to Hillary Clinton. 
if, like me, you started to look at social media follower numbers, you realized that he was going to crush her. Because he dominated her, not only on Twitter, but also on Facebook and also on Google search. So the 2016 election was a revelation about the new politics, the way that it plays out on social media, which turns out to create an advantage for a new kind of politician who specializes in sensation, whose populist message goes viral through platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Yes, the Russians exploited the vulnerabilities of platforms like Facebook and Twitter and others. All of this content that you see here was, in fact, made in Russia and designed to sow confusion and spread extreme views in America's political system. But Russian content was only around 1% of total content relating to the US election in 2016. Most of the extreme views, most of the fake news was generated by Americans. And if the Russians had just decided to stay home and focus on whatever Russians do when they're not hacking elections, I think the result would fundamentally have been the same. These social platforms are all invented by very liberal people on the West and East Coasts, and we figure out how to use it to push conservative values. I don't think they thought that would ever happen. That was Brad Pascal. Trump's digital media director shortly after the election. The Economist had it wrong. Social media's threat to democracy, no. It's social media's threat to liberalism that is the issue. Let me briefly summarize what I think the consequences of these two great surprises have been. Surprise number one, it's not a decentralized World Wide Web, it's dominated by centralizing network platforms. By the way, 80% of Americans now consume their news via either Facebook or Google, which is an astonishing fact. What are the consequences of the transformation of both capitalism and democracy by these network forces? Well, for Europe, which has no big technology companies, the only hope is to become the regulator of the network platforms. And that is what Margareta Vestager, the commissioner for competition, has been trying to do, fining and otherwise uh, punishing the US technology companies. But the really interesting story is what has happened in China. Whereas I mentioned earlier in my debate with Justin Lin, rival network platforms have been built behind a great firewall that essentially kept the big US technology companies from dominating the Chinese market. So the only rivals to the FANG companies are the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, plus JD. Te technology companies made in China. It's a two-power world on the internet. The big difference between the Chinese internet and the American internet is that it is very clear that the state dominates the companies in China. In the book, I talk about the square and the tower. The square is the realm of social networks. The tower is the realm of power. In China, the tower clearly dominates the square. And Jack Ma, who I believe is at this conference, said in a speech that he actually gave to a Communist Party conference, the political and legal system of the future is inseparable from big data. Bad guys won't even be able to walk into the square. And that sums up for me how ultimately network platforms in China will operate as agents of the Communist Party, no matter how much they may wish to be autonomous, they are subordinate to Xi Jinping, as that photograph 
illustrates. Partly because of the size of China's market, and partly because of the way in which the Chinese state has encouraged, particularly Alibaba and Tencent, China has in some ways overtaken the United States already in processing capacity, in computing power, and particularly in digital payments, China is ahead. This is a hugely important issue for all of us. It represents a fundamental change in the global financial system. As Americans waken up to the fact that China's network platforms are going to become competitors around the world and not just dominant in China, we enter what I called earlier today Cold War II. And this is a kind of first map of Cold War II, the Huawei map of the world. Those that have accepted Huawei are in red, those that have restricted Huawei are in blue, and everybody else is undecided. So this is, I think, the new map of the world, and it will turn out to apply not only in 5G, but in a whole range of other ways, such as digital payments. We are now in a kind of cyberspace race, like the space race there was between the United States and the Soviet Union. And just as the United States woke up to the Soviet challenge in 1957 when Sputnik was launched, the satellite that beat the United States in that space race, so America had another Sputnik moment when it realized that China could, in fact, beat the United States, not just in 5G networks, but also potentially in artificial intelligence and even in quantum computing. Let me conclude by saying... In this new Cold War between the two tech giants, the United States and China, being stuck in the middle is not going to be much fun. And that is a situation that not only South Korea finds itself in, but many, many, many other economies, including in your part of the world, Alexandra, and in Europe. It is a problem also for some technology companies in the United States perhaps most obviously, as this illustration shows for Apple. Apple's business model was what I call Chimerican. Designed in California, assembled in China. That's what it says on the iPhone. But those days are over, and Apple's only hope is to reinvent itself as another US-based network platform that isn't fundamentally dependent on China's manufacturing capacity. So that's the argument of my book. Now you can pretend to have read it. And more importantly, now you can ask me questions about it. Alexandra, you're going to start, and then we'll open it up to the audience. The World Knowledge Forum.